Good morning, I'm Kate Snow. And I'm Zin Kalias and Wah. Joe and Savannah are off this morning. Right now on Morning News Now, weekend of violence, more mass shootings across America. This morning, at least a dozen people are dead and many others wounded after several separate shootings spanning from coast to coast in the past 72 hours. We have team coverage as the debate grows over guns in America. Hitting the brakes this morning, prices at the pump reaching new record highs and forcing some drivers to rethink their summer travel plans. Almost $7 for regular. Crazy, never thought I would uh, live to see that. We'll tell you how some states are stepping in to drive the cost down and when you can start to feel some relief. Decisive vote breaking this morning, a big blow for British Prime Minister Boris Johnson as lawmakers announce a vote of confidence that could force him from power. We'll bring you the latest on the fallout and the continued criticism over the so-called Partygate scandal. And touching trend, a sign of solidarity to show cancer patients they're not alone. Loved ones and strangers alike shaving their heads to share their support. More on the gesture that's sending a message of love to people when they might need it most. I love to hear that. I love yeah, to see that, Kate. I know. We good need morning. more of that. Good we morning. need more of that. We need some good news this morning on a Monday. Yes. Good It'll to see nice. you. Yeah, great to see you too. Good to be with you. Yes. And we begin with another deadly shooting and a weekend of gun violence in America. At least 12 people were killed and nearly 40 others hurt after multiple mass shootings in the states across the country. Yeah, in Philadelphia, at least a dozen people were injured and three people killed in the popular South Street Inter Entertainment District. And in Chattanooga, Tennessee, three people were killed and 14 others were hurt after a mass shooting outside a night spot there. Today, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas is set to visit Uvalde, Texas, site, of course, of Rob Elementary and the massacre where 19 children and two teachers were slaughtered. Since that attack, less than two weeks ago, there have been more than 30 mass shootings in America. That's according to the Gun Violence Archive, which defines a mass shooting as an incident in which four or more people are shot or killed, not including the shooter. Again, look at that map. In the last two weeks, there have been 33 shootings, mass shootings. We have team coverage of this latest violence with NBC News reporter Julie Serkin on the push for action in Congress, NBC News correspondent Emily Aketa in Philadelphia, and NBC News reporter Liz McLaughlin with us in Uvalde, Texas. Thank you all for being with us. Uh, we're going to begin with Emily and Liz. Good morning. I wish we were talking about something else. Emily, the Philadelphia shooting happened Saturday night, an area popular with both locals and tourists. What's the latest on the ground for the search for the shooters? Okay, good morning to you. Still at this point, a lot of unanswered questions, including exactly how many people were involved in this shooting. Police believe there were five guns used in this shooting and looking at the shell casings on the ground after the fact. They think that it may have started from a fight between two men that had escalated to then an exchange of gunfire turning into a shooting uh, or a shootout rather of sorts. We know that one of those men, a suspected gunman, according to police, died in the shooting. The other other police say may have been shot by an officer. Keep in mind, officers have been on the ground in this area, patrolling the area on foot when the gunfire started flying, those bullets started flying. So they were able to almost immediately render aid to treat people who had been injured. And then one of the officers, according to Philadelphia police, started firing at the active gunman. According to police, they can't say for certain whether they struck him, but they say that he dropped his handgun and then he took off on foot. But a lot of these people, a lot of the 14 people struck in this shooting incident had actually been innocent bystanders, ranging from 17 years in age to 69 years in age. And looking at this street in South Street here, this is an iconic place in Philadelphia. We're within walking distance of Penn's Landing, of Independence Hall. Hundreds of people were gathered here. Keep in mind, hundreds of people. And so when bullets started flying, just a sheer chaos breaking yeah. out. Kate. Uh, Emily, thank you. Liz, I want to turn over to you. Secretary Mayorkas's visit, we mentioned, to Uvalde, it comes as the community, understandably, still struggling to come to terms, not only with what happened, but with the police response and all the criticism. What's on his agenda today? 
Kate, not many specifics, but Secretary Mayorkas is uh, expected to get here this morning, meet with the workforce and officials about two weeks ago. Uh, he praised Border Patrol agents who eventually encountered and killed that gunman. It was a tactical team that actually delayed or, uh, excuse me, went against the school district police chief's orders to stand down. And that was more than an hour after the shooting started. All of Secretary Mayorkas' uh, meetings will be behind closed doors. They will be private. Uh, as confusion and questions continue to swirl here, we're learning more about the timeline that's been changed four or five times after many inaccuracies from authorities here. Lots of tight lips from officials now, but we're learning more from people who were there that day, including a funeral home worker, Cody Briseño, who was uh, right across the street from Robb Elementary at Hillcrest Memorial, uh, near where the gunman crashed his vehicle, his uh, grandmother's truck. And he ran over to help with a coworker, asking if he was okay. And then he saw what he described as an evil look in his eye as he reached for his gun. Here's more from him on that harrowing account of the day. Let's listen. I run to the side, and while I'm running to the side, I'm on the phone with my wife. Hey, bring me my gun. Bring me my gun. And as I'm saying that to my wife, I could hear the, 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 the gun going off again. Pa, 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 pa. Like, What's going on? What's going on? That I, I told her that I bring me my gun because this guy's headed to the school. My intention was to stop him. And I mean, um, uh, I feel guilty, man, because I mean, I couldn't stop him. Just heartbreaking. If you can only imagine Briseño, not only the trauma of being shot at and running away, his wife did bring him his gun finally, and he went to the school, told police uh, that the gunman had gone inside and tried to enter himself, but they told him to stand back and shut up. So he feels so much guilt. And not only that, he's having to work one of two small funeral homes here. So he's buried five victims, including his own cousin. Just unimaginable. No, Kate. unimaginable. Liz, and you want to say to him, it's not your fault. Uh, Emily, the number of homicides in Philadelphia has more than doubled since 2013. What are people saying? Well, the Philadelphia Police Commissioner called this a dark day for the city, describing the shooting this weekend as horrendous and unthinkable. They actually just reopened South Street here within the last hour or so because they had closed it, not just because of the recent spate of shootings across the city, but specifically uh, on South Street here, what is typically a, a tourist magnet for both locals and then and people coming in from out of town. We've seen this steady rise in homicides since 2013, as you mentioned. Here's more from the Police Commissioner on the rise and violence. These incidents have an exponential effect on our community, and it not only impacts the individual that's been directly victimized, but it victimizes their loved ones, their families, and their neighbors, neighborhoods all over the world. It's unacceptable. It's beyond unacceptable. And we're still using every resource available to get to the bottom of what occurred, not just out there last night, but behind this gun violence in this city, period. And Philadelphia isn't alone in its fight and struggle to stem and curb uh, gun violence. More than one dozen cities across the country have set unfortunate records, all-time highs for the number of murders in 2021. Kate? Emily Akeda, Liz McLaughlin, thank you both so much. And in Washington, Congress returns from a holiday recess this morning, facing growing calls for federal action on gun reform. NBC News reporter Julie Serkin joins us now. Good morning, Julie. I want to get into the weeds a little bit. In the Senate, we have this group of bipartisan uh, lawmakers working on some kind of gun reform that could actually become law. So what's the latest on those negotiations? Yeah, good morning, Zinkle. So in the Senate, everything takes momentum. It's up to the senators to craft a package that could actually pass with 60 votes. Uh, but we heard yesterday from two negotiators in that group, just as the Senate gets ready to come back today into town and hold these conversations in person once again, uh, just some progress as to how the group is doing. I want you to take a listen. I've never been part of negotiations as serious as these. There are more Republicans at the table talking about changing our gun laws and investing in mental health 
than at any time since Sandy Hook. My hope is we'll, we'll get at least half the Republican conference. Um, you know, that, that's, that should be the goal here. Um, we're going to have to be realistic about what can do that. Um, Senator Murphy alluded to the idea that it's not going to be everything, certainly, that Democrats would like. Yeah, look, it's certainly not going to be nearly as expansive as Democrats are hoping it to be. In the House this week, they're going to vote on a series of bills that stand almost no chance in the Senate, including things like raising the minimum age to 21 for purchasing some of these rifles uh, and banning some high-capacity ammunition. Uh, but in the Senate, they're working on things like red flag laws, uh, enhanced background checks, though not as enhanced as the House would like to pass, as Democrats uh, would like. And look, Minority Leader McConnell who is going to have the final say here in order to get half of his conference on board with this, kept saying last week in Kentucky over and over again that the top two things that he's focused on is mental health and school safety. Hmm. And clearly a serious issue. We heard Senator Murphy speak to that. And another big issue on the Hill and in D.C. this week is the January 6th committee. Uh, they're expected to have more discussions this week. Those long-awaited public hearings on the Capitol attack are beginning Thursday. What can we expect from those? Yeah, look, it's been a year of closed door behind the scenes work for this committee in the House in which many times they faced opposition. They faced uh, blockades from the Republican members, including from President Trump, who have repeatedly called the committee illegitimate, though it is bipartisan, of course, with Vice Chair Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger, two Republicans on the nine member panel. But look, their first long awaited hearing is happening this Thursday, the first of at least six we are told, and they're going to be showing videos of some of the Trump family members and other folks that were testifying behind closed doors. They're hoping that this is the moment that the public really gets to see their work and gets to see what actually unfolded leading up to January 6th and what happened in the days after the insurrection and potentially linking the former president's involvement in all of this. And Julie, briefly, staying with January 6th, I know that over the weekend we got that news that the Justice Department has declined to prosecute Mark Meadows, that's former President Trump's chief of staff, for contempt of Congress. And at the same time, another top Trump advisor was arrested for snubbing congressional subpoenas. What should we know about this? Yeah, the committee has achieved a lot here in their words for getting Peter Navarro, for getting uh, Steve Bannon uh, to be indicted by the Justice Department. This is no small feat. Of course, that happened for Peter Navarro because he snubbed a congressional subpoena. He failed to cooperate uh, with the January 6th Select Committee. But the committee also says they are, quote, puzzled that Mark Meadows, Dan Scavino, two of former President Trump's uh, top officials, the Justice Department failed, uh, declined, I should say, to subpoena those, uh, to indict, excuse me, those two individuals. They say they don't understand why that happened. Of course, lawyers for Dan Scavino and Mark Meadows are pleased with the Justice Department's take care. Julie Serkin, important analysis. Thank you so much. Now to the economy and the skyrocketing price of gas filling up your tank is becoming more of a challenge now with the price of a gallon reaching another new high over the weekend. According to AAA, the national average of a gallon of regular right now, $4.84. That's an increase of 20 cents in just a week. So what's behind the new rise and what's being done to control the high costs of living right now? Let's bring in Caleb Silver, the editor-in-chief at Investopedia. Caleb, several states like New York, where I live in Georgia have suspended their gas taxes to try to help out drivers, but drivers are still paying a lot to fill up their tank. What's being done at the federal level to bring down prices, and, and, and when could we see changes? Yeah, unfortunately, it doesn't look great for gas prices for the rest of the summer. J.P. Morgan predicting we'll hit six bucks a gallon by the end Oof. of the summer. If you go out to California, there's a gas station that's selling gas at $9.60 up in Mendocino County. Not a lot the federal government can do except urge more production and more refinement, except we're kind of at capacity here in the U.S. In fact, we're about 5 percent below capacity from where we were at the beginning of the pandemic. A lot of refineries were shut down, and it takes a lot to get those to go to get back up to speed. And the U.S. is exporting a lot of its own oil right now to other countries who have turned away from importing it from Russia. So we have a real supply demand crunch going on right now, and that's going to impact drivers and the cost of gasoline for the next several months. I can't believe you said over $9 a gallon in California. That's crazy. The gas prices obviously impacting what we're all doing, our behavior. Right now, U.S. gasoline consumption levels are running 3% lower than a year ago, according to DataTrack. 
Those researchers called that number a, a troubling sign. Yeah. Uh, explain why that is troubling and what happens if gas consumption levels dip even lower, especially during what everybody thought was going to be a busy travel season? Yeah, that's something we like to call demand destruction. When prices get too high, consumers back out. So we're mm -hmm. driving a little bit less believe it or not, filling up a little bit less than we were a year ago, even though demand seems high because we're finally able to get out and drive around and go visit family and friends. But because prices remain high and keep climbing higher, folks are filling up less and less or finding alternative means. And you get that demand destruction here in gasoline, you could start to see it spreading to other parts of the economy. We know consumer sentiment is at a 10-year low. Consumer spending has hung in there. But the cure for high prices, Kate, is high prices because eventually consumers tap out. And so do small businesses. If you have to fill up a fleet of 10, 20 vans to keep your small business going, you're going to find other ways to do that. And that demand destruction eventually yeah. hurts spending. And spending drives 70 percent of U.S. GDP. And quickly, the other big elephant in the room, inflation right now. The feds are going to release the updated consumer price index from May, showing just how high costs are and if inflation has reached a peak. Uh, I know consumer price index did dip in April, but it's still at its highest in decades. Tell us about that. What do these new numbers mean? Yeah, we're going to get the consumer price index at the end of the week for last month. And what we're seeing is inflation may have peaked. It was 8.5 percent uh, in March. It was 8.3 percent in April. It may have peaked. That doesn't mean it's coming straight down the hill. We're going to have high prices across the commodities board through the rest of the summer, driven by energy, which then translates into higher fertilizer costs, higher shipping costs, basically higher costs for everything we pay. We have to deal with inflation right now because it's going to be with us for the rest of the summer, at least probably for the rest of the year. Caleb Silver, thanks so much for being with us. Now to some welcome news for parents of infants around the country who have been struggling during the baby formula shortage. Abbott Nutrition announced Saturday that it has resumed production of formula at its plant in Sturgis, Michigan. The plant shut down in February because of product contamination, making the nationwide shortage worse. Abbott says it will start on its Elecare brand of formula and other specialty formulas for infants with food allergies. Despite this good news, though, the Biden administration is being taken to task over its response time. Commerce Secretary Gia Raimondo told CNN's Jake Tapper Sunday that she didn't learn about the shortage until more than a month after the Michigan plant shut down. You're the Secretary of Commerce. When did you first learn of this problem? Uh, I first learned about it, you know, uh, a couple of months ago. So this is uh, this is, so a, this is a difficult issue, but uh, yes, probably April. NBC News correspondent Jesse Kirsch joins us now from Sturgis, Michigan, to talk about all this. Jesse, good to see you. Now that Abbott has restarted production, when can we realistically expect to see products on store shelves? Yes, and Clay, it looks like that's at least a couple of weeks away from now. They've restarted production here. They're prioritizing uh, specifically some of their specialty formulas because we know that, of course, many children, many babies rely on these formulas. But uh, there are people who specifically rely on those uh, that are for people with allergies and, and have other specialty needs. So Abbott says it is prioritizing those, beginning with Elicare, which will be released to the public, they say, to consumers around June 20th. So they're saying released. I'm trying to get some clarity on what exactly that release is. Does that mean that's when we'll see trucks rolling out of the plant here in Michigan? Does that mean that's when it'll hit store shelves? So we're trying to get some clarity on that. And also, they say around June 20th. They don't give a specific date. Do want to reference uh, part of a statement that Abbott shared on Saturday. The company saying, we understand the urgent need for formula, and our top priority is getting high-quality, safe formula into the hands of families across America. So that is what the company says it is focused on right now, again, specifically looking at those specialty formulas first. And Jesse, I'm glad you highlighted what they said about high quality, safe formula, right? Because it's important we don't forget this plant shut down because of contamination problems that could have been fatal to infants. So now that it's back up and running, what stipulations did the FDA put in place in order for Abbott to safely restart? Yeah, so the Biden administration has uh, put in place a de consent decree uh, that, that, that they're in agreement with right now with Abbott. And that decree uh, specifically emphasizes several points, through, uh, both for initial startup and also for months from now for Abbott Nutrition to maintain this plant. But bottom line, to get things back up and running here, the FDA has said that it needs to see from Abbott a, an independent expert come in, look at their sanitation processes, their 
their dry out processes so that they have uh, proper protocols in place here. They also want to see environmental testing. So mm -hmm. all of that has had to be gone through and shared with the FDA according to this consent decree before uh, production could restart here. And Abbott says that it has met the initial requirements set in place. And Jesse, real quickly and briefly, we've seen the Biden administration fly infant formula from overseas. Are those flights still happening? And what else is the Biden administration doing to help ease the shortage as it stands right now? Yeah, so the White House says that there are more Operation Fly Formula flights that will be coming to the U.S. later this week. We expect two to be coming from Melbourne, Australia, to the States uh, by week's end. They'll, they'll be taking off later this week. And then there's also the Defense Production Act, which is a common term now because of what has gone on throughout the pandemic. Bottom line, though, that allows the White House to prioritize uh, the production of baby formula and specifically looks to compel suppliers to provide supplies, ingredients to baby formula suppliers ahead of other uh, customers to try to get more formula on shelves sooner. We've seen a lot of shortages during this pandemic. Thanks for breaking this one down. Jesse, thanks. Now to that dramatic news from overseas. By the end of the day, the United Kingdom could be in need of a new prime minister. This afternoon, Boris Johnson will face a vote that could remove him from power. It's the latest fallout from the revelations about lockdown parties in his Downing Street residence that landed Johnson with a fine from police. NBC News correspondent Stephanie Gosk joins us now from outside Parliament in London. Steph, good to see you. Good morning. Uh, this is quite a turn for Boris Johnson. It comes less than three years after he secures a Brexit deal with the European Union. He's swept into victory in 2019. How did we get here, and what does it mean? Yeah. Yeah, you know, Katie, he came in very popular. Um, and this is one of those situations of people getting upset about a politician standing up and saying, do as I say, not as I do. And these revelations were made public that these parties took place in Downing Street, and there were a number over a period of a year, according to a report that just came out uh, last month, that during the height of the pandemic, when people were being told not to gather, not to not to go inside, not to basically to seclude themselves at home and not see friends and family, there were a series of parties that were held that Boris Johnson attended himself. And they were parties that included alcohol and food and didn't really look a lot like essential business. And they were indoors and outdoors. And what happened was he stood up in front of Parliament and he said there were no rules broken. He then had to come back and say, well, it appears rules were broken and I didn't realize it. Then, he is, as you say, he was fined 50 pounds for uh, attending a birthday party. All of this has undermined people's confidence in him, even within his own party. And this is important for, for to, tonight. This is about his party, the Conservative Party. They are the ones calling for this no-confidence vote. At least 54 members of the party had to write letters to a committee saying they wanted to hold this vote. But a lot more will have to vote against him uh, in this in this vote this evening. 180 have to vote no confidence mm -hmm. in him for him to be removed from office. But watch those numbers, right? Even if he does win this vote later on tonight, if the margin is really small, he may still have to step down in a matter of months because the ministers will say it's really just untenable for you to continue as prime minister, Kate. Okay, that makes sense. And, and if he if he loses, if if he if all those people go against him, or if he, you know, if, if, if as you say, if he wins by not very much, what what happens next? Well, if he loses, then he steps down. I mean, he will be removed, uh, and then the party will have to vote for someone else. And that's a process that could take that could take weeks. Uh, but, but again, you have this situation. This happened with Prime Minister Theresa May as well. In 2018, there was a no confidence vote that she won, but a third of her party voted against her. And eventually, months later, she had to say, this was during Brexit and her handling of Brexit, that she was going to step down. He, it, it won't leave this country without a leader. He continues to be prime minister until they select someone to, to take, take over. Now, you know, Boris Johnson is also a pretty stubborn guy, and you have to imagine he's going to stick around. And, and the feeling is, is that he will survive this vote. But again, it'll be the question of those margins. Stephanie Gosk, thanks for being with us. Appreciate it.
Turning to Miami, cleanup is underway this morning after a storm system brought torrential rain, winds, and flooding to the city Saturday. The storm dumped more than 10 inches of rain on Miami over three days. Winds were clocked at 40 miles per hour, but it wasn't quite strong enough to be classified as a tropical storm. The most serious impact was from the flooding. Fire crews rescued several drivers stranded as the waters quickly rose. The storm also left about 4,000 without power in Miami-Dade County. Let's get a check of your morning news now. Weather. Michelle Grossman joins us now. Michelle, good morning. Good morning to you both. So good to see you on this Monday morning. And yeah, we had a lot of rain in Florida Friday into Saturday, nearly 15 inches in some spots. And we do have our first name storm of the season. That's Tropical Storm Alex, although it wasn't a tropical storm officially when it dropped that rain in Florida. So here, here are some of your rainfall totals. Hollywood, Florida, 14.85 inches of rain, and it came quickly. So that's why we all saw all those flooding pictures uh, throughout the weekend in Florida. Miami, over 11 inches of rain. Naples, Florida, over 8 inches and over six and a half inches of rain in West Palm Beach. So we're going to be drying out on this Monday. Now here's the latest on Tropical Storm Alex. Winds at 65 miles per hour, so still pretty strong. It's affecting Bermuda right now with tropical storm conditions. It's moving quickly the east-northeast at 28 miles per hour. That's good news. It's going to zip on out of here, but first bringing those tropical storm conditions to Bermuda. And then it's going to weaken rapidly. It's facing some wind shear. It's facing some cooler waters as well. So we're going to see it a remnant low by later on today and then it's going to become history. Now, we are also watching some severe weather, also showers and storms, a soggy start for many on our Monday. You can see some lightning, hearing some thunder in parts of the Central Plains into the mid-Mississippi Valley. So 6 million people at risk today. We're looking at the chance for some damaging hail an inch or greater. Winds gusting to 60 miles per hour. Could also see a few tornadoes. So we're going to watch that as we go throughout the day, especially where we're seeing that uh, yellow shading from parts of the Dakotas into Kansas, Nebraska, and the panhandle of Oklahoma and also Texas. And then we're looking at some uh, some storms, likely Paducah also into Memphis. Tomorrow we're looking at severe weather, likely, where we're looking at uh, Nebraska, Kansas, into the panhandles of Texas and Oklahoma once again, with the chance of some large hail, two inches or greater, winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour, and also the chance for some severe weather once again in terms of tornadoes. Rainfall forecast, that's going to be a big one. Heavy rainfall totals up to four inches in a lot of spots, especially where you see those yellows, the reds, the oranges. That's where we're uh, seeing the heaviest rain. And as we go throughout today. We're also looking at a nice day. We had a beautiful weekend in the Northeast. We're going to see that once again, you guys, in uh, New England all the way down to the Mid-Atlantic. Back to you. A lot of dangerous weather to watch out for. Yeah. Yeah. Now with the latest on the war in Ukraine and a new threat from Vladimir Putin. The Russian president warned the United States and the West that new targets would be hit if Ukraine continued to receive those long-range missile systems capable of reaching Russia. That warning turned into action yesterday when Russia struck Kyiv with several missiles for the first time in five weeks. NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber joins us now from Odessa in southern Ukraine to discuss this and more. Ellison, good morning. It's good to see you. What more can you tell us about this attack on Kyiv and this new warning made by Putin. Yeah, so Russian officials, they say they were targeting tanks that were delivered to Ukraine by other countries. Ukrainian officials say that Russian missile targeted and struck a place where they do railway repairs for trains that deliver grain. In Kyiv of late, it's been relatively quiet. Russia tried to take Kyiv in February. They failed. Even though there's been this slight sense of normalcy, reminders in Kyiv of the war are all around. Burned out Russian tanks, uh, bombed buildings, checkpoints, things like that, that don't let you forget that there is a war, even in those moments where prior to this latest airstrike, things might have felt a bit calm. But obviously, those airstrikes shattered whatever tiny bit of normalcy many residents felt. Uh, and to a lot of people, particularly in Kyiv, there was no question that it was an unnecessary target, something that they say had very little to do with the military, if anything at all. Again, they say that this was a place where they were repairing railway cars that were used to transport grain. Um, Vladimir Putin, he had a new warning, if you will, for the United States and others saying this in part. He said that if the West delivers any longer range rocket systems, Moscow will, and I'm quoting here, draw appropriate conclusions and use our means of destruction. 
which we have plenty of in order to strike at those objects that we haven't yet struck. Among other weapons, the United States is planning to send to Ukraine are what's known as HIMARS. Those are uh, high-tech, medium-range rocket launchers. It'll take about three weeks for those actually to get to Ukraine. But as a part of the deal between the United States and Ukraine, those are systems that will only be used uh, to protect Ukraine in a defensive posture, not to strike any sort of targets on the other uh, side of, of the battle line. Sinclair. And Allison, you said this disrupted a sense of normalcy. Are more cities in western mm -hmm. and southern Ukraine preparing for potential new attacks? What's the scene like where you are in Odessa? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they are, and they really have never stopped preparing for the possibility of other attacks. And where we are is a reminder. This is a hotel in Odessa. It was struck by a rocket on May 8th at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I was speaking with the owner of this hotel, and he said... No one was really here except for a couple staffers who were trying to get this hotel ready for the tourist season. Uh, Russian media, other people claimed that there were some sort of military foreign fighter series. That that's absolutely not the case. It was just a few civilians who were here trying to get this ready for tourist season and also to try and open some rooms up for refugees who might need a place to stay. We had the opportunity to talk to a military official with uh, here in Odessa earlier this morning. Listen to some of what he had to say. I stress that, that this, the enemy doesn't have enough capacity to attack us from Transnistria region or even try to. There are a lot of talks about possible uh, paratroopers coming from Russia to Transnistria. But this is just idiot's dream. Any Russian plane uh, will not be able to fly through Ukrainian territory. It will be destroyed. There will be no second front from Transnistria. Ellison Barber with a compelling interview from Odessa this morning for us. Thanks so much. John Herbst now for more on the situation in Ukraine. He's the former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine and a senior director of the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center. Mr. Ambassador, good morning. Glad you're with us. Uh, you. What do you make of Vladimir Putin's warnings over the weekend? And, and could this mark a new phase of the conflict? Um, Putin's already begun a new phase when he retreated from Kiev and began his offensive in the Donbass. Um, this warning is because he's afraid of the impact of the weapons we're sending to Ukraine. He's trying to intimidate us and our NATO allies from sending additional such equipment. Uh, it's worth pointing out that long before we sent this equipment, he was attacking Kiev, he was attacking Lviv. So this is a pretty empty threat because, again, he realized that if we continue to send weapons of this caliber, his forces in the East are likely not to succeed. So we're learning this morning that the U.K. is moving forward with its latest shipment of long-range missiles to Ukraine. Do you think the U.S. and its allies should rethink their strategy to supply Ukraine if Russia steps up attacks across the region? Or, or based on what you just said, maybe you're, you're not so worried about that? No, on the contrary. We should be sending more. Mm. In fact, the HIMARS we're sending, we're only sending four. We need to send a lot more than that. That's a, a trickle. Um, the Russians are using their standard tactics of massive artillery bombardment against not just soldiers, but against civilians. If we can provide Ukraine an antidote to that, the ability to strike back, Russian offensive in the East will fail. It may fail in any case, but fewer Ukrainians will die if we send more of these missiles. Let's talk about eastern Ukraine for a second. Are you encouraged by the fact that Russia has not taken full control of Severodonetsk yet? Well, the Russians have made, I'm sorry to say, some incremental gains. And I'm concerned about that because Russia has a great, great advantage in tanks, in air power, and in artillery. But the fact they haven't gotten that far in the East, despite these great advantages, is a sign for a little bit of optimism. But again, the best thing we could do to defend American interests, because if Putin wins in Ukraine, he's going to go after our Baltic NATO allies, and our soldiers will have to defend the Baltic states. If we can send Ukraine more and sophisticated weapons to stop Putin in Ukraine, in Donbass, we will not have to worry about our Baltic allies. Ambassador John Herbst, thanks so much for your perspective. Appreciate it. With the country reeling from mass shootings like the one in Uvalde, Texas, there is an effort underway to stop school violence before it starts. NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster takes us inside a Texas school for a lesson that could save kids' lives.
What's the second step? Inside this Dallas Middle School, today's lesson is about preventing school tragedies. We will be discussing topics and images around bullying, violence, suicide, and self-harm. The program is called Say Something. It's run by Sandy Hook Promise, a group formed after the 2012 shooting in Connecticut at Sandy Hook Elementary School that took 26 lives. The free class teaches students how to recognize warning signs, like peers posting threatening messages online, bragging about guns, or expressing suicidal thoughts. Schools and the threats they face have changed dramatically. The goal here is to empower students to quickly flag them. Students are on the front lines. They see things through social media, um, through conversations with their peers. Using real-life examples... He posted this, don't come to school tomorrow if you want to live. More than 3 million students nationwide have been trained to alert a trusted person or to submit an anonymous tip using the secure app. They might not act immediately. It's because that they don't want to be called a snitch. You beat me to the punch. The program emphasizing it's not about snitching, but getting help to those who need it. You didn't feel safe after Uvalde, after going through this class, what are you thinking? Um, after going through this class, I feel super safe. Anything can happen. Anything. You should just always keep an open eye out for things. Kids feeling responsible for their own protection. Shaquille Brewster, NBC News, Dallas. Right now, COVID cases are rising across the country, but are we on the verge of a summer surge? Mm. The United States is reporting an average of around 120,000 cases a day, and those are only the cases that are being reported to public health officials. There are concerns the number could be significantly higher, especially with the availability of at-home tests. This leaves a lot of questions for experts on just how contagious this current strain could be. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Kavita Patel joins us now. I started to say, I hope not. I hope mm. we're not on the verge of, of more. Uh, Dr. Patel, restrictions have pretty much lifted across the U.S. People are, are not getting seriously ill from COVID as they once were. So what should we make of cases still rising? Yeah, good morning, Kate and Zinclay. So I am going to give you some good news. We are seeing cases rising, but in many parts where we saw these cases rising initially, Northeast, mid-Atlantic, we are seeing them plateauing and obviously on the other end coming down, hopefully in the next several weeks. So that does mean there are parts of the United States, namely parts of the South, parts of the West, Midwest that are going up. But again, this matches almost to a T every surge we've had with the exception to your point, that we're not seeing as many hospitalizations. So the summer is supposed to be a summer of hopefully recovery, but that's really if you're vaccinated, boosted, and you're smart and aware of your surroundings. Don't be, don't be in crowded spaces with people who are coughing and not wearing masks. Take stock of who you're around and what you're doing when you're doing that. Mm, prevention is key. And as you talk about hospitalization, I think about how many people are not vaccinated, specifically kids, right? And I know that right. many kids under the age of five still are not eligible, all of them. And last week, Pfizer asked the FDA to authorize its vaccine for kids six months to four years old. But while we wait for any approval, what's your advice to parents of young kids right now, especially if they're planning to travel this summer and want to keep their kids safe? Yeah, I think that this is literally what I think has been flooding a lot of uh, my inbox, as well as a number of other concerned kind of pediatricians. Both Moderna and Pfizer are up on deck for getting vaccines available for the under five set. But as you mentioned, it's not going to be soon. Three things. Number one, surrounding an unvaccinated child with as many vaccinated people is critical. It makes a difference. Number two, trying to find a mask if you're traveling planes, trains, automobiles that have other people on them trying to find a mask that the child can wear. It's not perfect, and I wouldn't force a child to wear something that they're not comfortable with because any mask is better than no mask. And then third, just being mindful of the symptoms, just back to what we were saying. I, look, a lot of us, including myself, have had allergy symptoms, but you don't know their allergies unless you're testing. So the third layer of protection is really minimizing exposure to people who might have any symptoms until they test and until you can feel safe around them. But you can have children out safely, and I'm hoping families do. Dr. Patel, I want to ask about long COVID. I've reported a lot about this. Doctors don't fully understand it yet. Do they know how this current strain of COVID might impact people long term, even if they're vaccinated? Yeah, Kate, this is, I think, uh, going to be what defines kind of our generation to come for how we treat COVID, because I do think long COVID 
or post-acute kind of complications of COVID are chronic disease. We're going to talk about them like we do diabetes this year and in years to come. I think the most important thing that we know about this variant is that it can cause long COVID. It takes weeks or months to see the effects of, of these viruses on long COVID. So we don't have data from people who just recently got infected, but we do have data from people in November that are reporting symptoms and they look similar to what we saw before. Vaccination helps, but it's not foolproof and even vaccinated people can get long COVID. It's why all in all, try to avoid getting sick if you can. I think a good takeaway to end on, <laughs> try to avoid getting sick. Yeah. Dr. Kavita Patel, thank you so much. Summer is in the air and as schools let out and temperatures rise, many folks will start heading back to the beach or community pools. But unfortunately, cities across the nation are struggling to find enough lifeguards to keep pools open. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky explains what's behind the shortage and how some cities are enticing new lifeguards. <laughs> In the blistering Texas heat, Sweet. these teams are diving in. Call 911, I need a backboard, an AED. They're training to save lives as the nation now faces a dire shortage of lifeguards. In Austin, they have fewer than half of the 750 they need. Jody Jay is the city's assistant director of Parks and Recreation. She says the pressure's on to safely staff dozens of public pools for families counting on inexpensive summer fun. In a perfect world, you'd have 34 pools open. Right. How many are you prepared to open now? We're looking at having 15 pools open. The American Lifeguard Association says the shortage could close at least a third of the nation's 309,000 public pools. And it could mean fewer eyes on beaches, too. So where did all the lifeguards go? When pools shut down during the pandemic, many didn't keep up with the required training. Other workers went elsewhere. And now with the strongest job market in years, it often comes down to who's offering the best pay. How are you trying to sweeten the deal? Our lifeguards make anywhere between $16 and $19 an hour. We also have a $1,250 worth of bonuses. Across the country, other communities are also ramping up recruiting efforts. Down south in Mobile, Alabama. If they pay for the um, training session, we will give them the money back at the end of the season. In the heartland, Cincinnati's offering a $2,000 bonus for lifeguards who stay through the summer. So we're trying to encourage people, seniors, young people, all ages, if you can swim, come and get certified as a lifeguard. At Weston Phoenix, they offered a $2,500 bonus to early season hires. Back in Texas, Barton Springs Pool is one of Austin's biggest tourist attractions. Its hours of operation had been temporarily cut back. It's kind of hard to plan around it. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's disappointing. Aquatic supervisor DeAndre Kane says staff is now working overtime to fill the need. What's the plan? The plan is to train, 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 train. We're going to keep advertising. Fingers crossed, prayers up. I think we're going to be able to do it. Cities hoping for a rebound to keep a summer tradition going strong. Morgan Chesky, NBC News. Austin. My daughter is actually a lifeguard this Ooh. summer, which I guess is really needed. Financial headlines <laughs> now and Elon Musk now clarifying reports that said that he was considering cutting Tesla's workforce. That's right. CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins us now with more on that and the rest of the day's business headlines. Good morning, Silvana. Good morning to you guys. Yep, so Elon Musk is backtracking or at least clarifying news about possible job cuts at Tesla. In an email sent to executives on Thursday, which was seen by Reuters, Musk said he has a super bad feeling about the economy and needed to cut jobs by about 10 percent. But replying to a tweet this weekend, Musk says Tesla's total headcount will increase over the next year, but the number of salaried staff should be flat. The company had about 100,000 employees at the end of last year. Apple kicks off its annual developers conference today with a keynote address by CEO Tim Cook. Much of the focus will be on software, and analysts say iOS 16 will include upgrades to the iPhone screen lock, messaging, and health features. Improvements to the iPad will reportedly make it seem more like a laptop, making it easier to switch between tasks and handle multiple apps at the same time. One item we likely won't see at the Apple event, the long-rumored mixed reality headset. Reports say it's being delayed until next year due to issues with the battery life and performance. But the New York Times says Apple is enlisting the help of Hollywood directors like John Favreau to create content for the headset. Favreau currently produces Prehistoric Planet for Apple TV+. Plus. Back to you. No. And 
Oh, I was going to say, and like a million other things, too. I know. Right? Exactly. They always have yes. so many things coming out. I can't keep up. I know. But, yeah. <laughs> but thank you for keeping us posted. Sylvana. You got it. More than 1,000 people walked over 17 miles here in Manhattan from dawn to dusk on Saturday night to support suicide prevention. Why do I know this? Because that's my family. We were among them. Out of the darkness overnight walks. It's a walk that helps save lives helps bring hope to those affected by suicide, raises awareness. Among the walkers were people that have lost a friend or a family member, also survivors, people who are struggling themselves right now. It's all organized by the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. The walk started with an opening ceremony as the sun set, and then that's me at 3 in the morning. <laughs> it all ended with the rising sun which was absolutely beautiful. And Zinkley, there were these luminarias, these beautiful mm. little bags, you know, filled with sand and a candle. Um, and they each had the name on them of someone who's been lost. So wow. that's, that's Papa, that's my father-in-law, who mm. we lost to suicide. And it was, when you're walking in at the end, there were just rows and rows of these luminarias. I have to say it was the most moving event and, and so supportive, right? It yeah. felt like you're part of a community who's speaking out and, and saying out loud that we've been affected in some way by, by suicide. Mm, and I'm sure physically demanding, but also emotionally. And I'm sure that was just such a personal experience. Yeah, it was. But I, I'll tell you, it was, it was like uplifting. It wasn't mm. sad. It was feeling like you're part of a community. But physically, Zinkley? <laughs> Were you limping, I just, Kate? You I just limping? walked from the studio over here and I was like, oh! Because 17 miles, I, I am a runner and I thought it would be easy. It was not easy. Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> I'm so glad easy, you got to do it, Kate. That's part of it. That's part of the whole thing. Um, and if, by the way, Zinkley, I think we should say this. If anyone you know is struggling out there, you can call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline right now. It's 800-273-8255 or text TALK to 741741. I saw people wearing shirts that said that on Saturday. By the way, we're about to move to 988 as a number in July, but right now it's that number that you just saw as in place. So important. Kate, thank you so much. And across the country, there's another show of solidarity. People are shaving their heads to let loved ones battling cancer know they're not alone. MSNBC anchor Jose Diaz Bailar shows us how this small act is making a huge difference. It's become a touching gesture of solidarity. Like this one in Florida, a surprise show of support for loved ones undergoing difficult treatments for cancer. In Georgia, Maggie Burns wanted to make her mom feel a little less alone in her battle against breast cancer. That's Maggie's mom, Tanya Hutchinson, getting her head shaved while going through chemotherapy. Then this <laughs> The reveal, Maggie's head shaved too, an emotional tribute to her mom. I've not had one regret since. I mean, my appearance is nothing compared to the love that I have for this woman beside me right now. It was sad and scary because some of my self-identity is tied up in my appearance. But when she took the, the beanie off in the barbershop, I just knew right then that she really, really, truly loved me. This was unexpected. In April, Coon Rapids, Minnesota firefighter Christian Warby was about to undergo a stem cell transplant to fight a rare form of blood cancer. Look at that, Christian. But then, the co-workers he considers brothers answered the call to action. Dozens uniting to shave their heads to honor his bravery. Yeah, it was, I was bowled over. I really was. Just seeing all those faces, all those guys lined up and knowing that they were there to get their heads buzzed right there for me. It was incredibly moving. Yeah, when you look around at all the other guys and see that their hair is buzzed, it, you do immediately think back to Christian. It also helps build a bond between all of us because we were all there together and, and it's just a reminder of that family. <laughs> that type of teamwork playing out across the country, like at this elementary school in Indiana, a fundraiser to fight childhood cancer. Having the feeling that you're helping somebody live a better life, it's such a great feeling. <laughs> Small acts of love to let others know they're all in it together. The only thing that I wanted my mama to know was that she was loved more than she could imagine. And she was not alone, and she would never be alone.
Mm. Our thanks to Jose Diaz Bellart for that story. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.